Good evening, everybody. Grab your seats. My name is Harold Islin. I'm a member of the Archives Partnership Trust Board, and I'm chair of tonight's event. On behalf of our board members and stewards, welcome to this special evening. And let me say how great it is that we all are here in person and welcome to the people who are joining us by video. The Archives Partnership Trust is the nonprofit arm of the State Archives and supports preservation, education, and outreach programs such as tonight's event. By raising support for preservation, education, and outreach, the Trust keeps current and future generations connected to our collective past. The State Archives safeguards and makes accessible millions of records of New York State and colonial governments, including records from the Office of the State Attorney General. These materials are essential to tell the story of New York and its citizens. Tonight's guests epitomize the meaning of public service, and we are honored to host tonight's conversation between a legend who forever reshaped the Office of the Attorney General and a history-making advocate who now leads it. This evening's event is a true collaborative effort. Special thanks to tonight's partner organizations, the Government Law Center at Albany Law School, the Historical Society of the New York Courts, the League of Women Voters of New York State, the New York State Bar Association, and the New York State Writers Institute at the University of Albany. It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague at Greenberg Traurig, and more importantly, my friend, Henry Greenberg, who will introduce tonight's guest speakers. Good evening. The great United States Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, described attorneys in public service as the people's lawyers. That phrase, the people's lawyers, captures the highest aspiration of the legal profession, which is to do justice by preserving and protecting the public. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from two individuals who have devoted their professional lives to that high and noble calling. Robert Abrams and Letitia James, respectively the 60th and the 67th Attorneys General of New York State, represent all that is good in law and government. Throughout their trailblazing careers, they have exemplified the best in public life. Take Bob Abrams. Born and raised in the Bronx from humble beginnings, he willed himself and rose to become a member of the New York State Assembly, Bronx Borough President, and for 14 years from 1979 to 1993, New York's Attorney General. His crusading work as the state's chief law enforcement officer made him a legend. As a reformer, he battled political machine bosses and special interests. He won historic victories for consumers. He protected the environment. He fought for women's rights to choose and the rights of LGBTQ. As president of the National Association of Attorneys General, he led attorney generals across the nation to fight for the rights of all Americans. And owing to his determined leadership, he transformed the Attorney General's office and wrought it into the finest, most potent public interest law firm on the planet. It is for these reasons that New York's Justice Building, just a few blocks from here, is named the Robert Abrams Building for Law and Justice. In a moment, we are going to hear about his extraordinary new book entitled Luckiest Guy in the World. But in truth, it is all of us, it is all New Yorkers who are lucky 
indeed blessed to have Robert Abrams in public life for so many years. And speaking of legal icons tonight, we also have the rare honor of hearing from a history maker in her own right, our current Attorney General, Letitia James. She is the first woman of color to hold statewide office in New York and the first woman to be elected Attorney General. She has battled tirelessly for social justice, economic justice, and environmental justice. Her principled, fearless, apolitical leadership has advanced the rule of law and the rights of all New Yorkers, and her record of accomplishment stretches back decades. Before becoming Attorney General, she was public advocate for the city of New York, the first woman of color to hold citywide office in the greatest city in the world. Before that, she served on the New York City Council for 10 years. Before that, she headed the Attorney General's Brooklyn Regional Office. Letitia James epitomizes what Justice Brandeis meant when he spoke of the people's lawyer. You know, we live in a cynical age. Displays of respect for public service and public servants are rare. The coarsening of public discourse quickens. The polarization of our politics widen. But tonight, tonight we are going to hear from two individuals who are our answer to the cynics. Two individuals who are the best of the best, a perfect blend of courage, competence, and compassion. I am proud to give you, please join me in welcoming Robert Abrams and Letitia James. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I have the honor and privilege of being with my mentor, Rob Abrams, who uh, has taught me so much and inspired me. And this book, I hope all of you read the forward. <laughs> <laughs> Great forward, outstanding. <laughs> it was my honor and my privilege to write the forward. It's an inspiring book, an encouraging book. And it's a book which underscores, underscores your values. Um, we find ourselves in a very dark moment in history in our country. So my first question to you, Mr. Abrams, is what do you think about what's, what's happening in our country, how divisive we are, the rhetoric? What are your thoughts? Well, it's distressing. And uh, obviously, it also has spilled over into politics, or maybe it's emanated from uh, political leaders. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon people like you and I uh, to dissipate that and to say that there is an alternative. Uh, I think <clears throat> your career, my career, our values uh, are those of inclusiveness, reaching out. You know, when I was gonna ask you this, Tish, what things are like today with AGs, when I was attorney general, uh, I, I had the good fortune of being the president of the National Association of Attorneys General, and there wasn't partisanship. Uh, there were re Republicans that were very conservative, moderates, Democrats who were liberals in the center, and yet we all worked together. We were brothers and sisters in a common cause in trying to help our constituents, utilize the powers of the Attorney General's office to protect the environment, to protect them as consumers, to protect their civil rights. And it didn't matter whether we were Democrats or Republicans, whether uh, we represented a large state or a small state, or from the South or the North or the East and the West. And we collaborated together. In fact, we, we did things that were never done before. We, we worked together in having joint investigations and joint prosecutions. And, and so it's, it's distressing uh, to see what's going on in the country, but 
you and I can demonstrate, uh, you know, to large numbers of people in the, in, in the public that it can be different. And, um, and, and to encourage young people to, to enter politics, you know, not to be discouraged by, I guess that there's a lot that can cause somebody to say, gee, I don't want to go near that stuff. Right. Um, so obviously it, it's bad. There's gridlock in Washington. Things don't get done. I mean, one of the exciting things for me in being attorney general was the fact that you could actually do things that were important to people. You know, you didn't have to rely upon a Congress to pass a law. You can bring a lawsuit that could return millions of dollars to consumers. You can bring a lawsuit that could clean up the environment. You can bring a lawsuit that protected women's reproductive freedom. Um, and you had the power to decide when to bring that lawsuit how to resolve that lawsuit, uh, whether it should be a civil investigation, a lawsuit, or impanel a grand jury. So that's what made uh, the attorney general's office extremely exciting. And, and I, I'm so excited to see you in that office because you're carrying on that tradition. You become a leader among attorneys general in the country. And um, you know, I, I, I'm sure you share my view that it's a great privilege to have the opportunity to serve as an attorney. It's an honor and a privilege. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about public policy and the role of attorney generals shortly, but it's entitled the luckiest guy in the world, not in the state, not in the nation, <laughs> the world. <laughs> what makes you the luckiest guy in the world? A lot of things. Okay. First of all, my family. Uh, my wife is here tonight. We're celebrating uh, 47 years of marriage. We've got two daughters who produced eight grandchildren for us. I never thought that that would be the case. <laughs> um, I consider myself lucky because uh, I had an opportunity to serve the people of New York in three different offices. I, I was a 27-year-old kid, just two years out of law school, and the people of my assembly district gave me a chance to come to Albany uh, to serve in the legislature. And then I served three terms as borough president of the Bronx and four terms as attorney general. What a privilege, that, that, that was lucky for me because I had the chance to, to, uh, to do things, you know, on behalf of, of the public interest. And, you know, lots of things were lucky, you know, in my life. I, I talk in the book how I, I went to see a doctor 12 years ago and he told me that uh, I had a malignant tumor uh, and a serious cancer situation. And it wound up to be, a a 25 centimeter tumor that weighed 25 pounds. And I was under the knife for over six hours and had 12 pints of blood and transfusions. And, and here I am pretty healthy today, 12 years later. <laughs> so, uh, lots that make me lucky, not just as the luckiest guy in New York, but in the world. So we both come from humble beginnings. You from the Bronx and me from Brooklyn. I refer to it as B squared, um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing, upbringing and your family. I know your family owned a supermarket or a, a deli, luncheonette. a luncheonette. Candy store, a luncheonette. Luncheonette. Yeah. And here you are, the, the attorney general, former borough president, former assembly member. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Yeah, well, you know, the first day I served as attorney general, a guy named Stan Brooks, he was a veteran reporter for WINS. Yes. And he came to interview me and I was in two World Trade Center at the time, the 47th floor. Mm -hmm. And we looked at, and he said, so what's it like, Mr. Attorney General, being the Attorney General of the state of New York the first day you're in this office? And I said, Stan, I, I, I'm looking out the window and there is the Statue of Liberty. What a country. My grandparents were, were escaping oppression from Eastern Europe and they came on a ship. I don't even think they saw the statue. They were probably down in steerage and couldn't even get up to the deck. So I, I, it's, it's part of being lucky and part of you know, being, growing up in the Bronx was fantastic. There was a sense of community in the neighborhood. Um, my family all lived in the Bronx. Uh, my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents, they were nearby. Um, uh, growing up, I, 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 that's, that, that's what helped shape my values, I think. My grandparents, my, my father would talk about how it was tough 
for his parents to come here as immigrants uh, to create a new life. Uh, it was the days of sweatshops, terrible working conditions. Um, uh, my father would uh, always tell me how it was important to really fight for the little guy, the ordinary guy. He'd take me into the polling booth when, to, to vote. And he, even though he and my mom were Roosevelt Democrats, he would tell me and he'd show me, I'm gonna register a protest vote. <laughs> Those Democrats, they're not doing enough for the people. And he'd vote the liberal party line. He'd vote the American Labor Party line. One of his heroes was Vito Mark Antonio, a member of Congress from East Harlem, who was a member of the American Labor Party. Leo Isaacson was a congressman who ran on the American Labor Party ticket. So those, those were part of my roots that helped shape my, my understanding about life and my values. And, and uh, you know, I consider myself lucky to come from that kind of a family that's not only loving, but gives you a, a good sense of mission and purpose. So that rebellion that was exhibited by your father at the polling site, is that one of the reasons why you were so anti-establishment or anti-entrenched um, interest? Well, I mean, you know, how I got into politics is a, is a lead into the answer to that question. Uh, I, I never thought I'd run for public office. I was a student at Columbia College. I had a wonderful professor, David Truman. I took a government course and the assignment was you have to write a paper on your congressional district. I want to know everything about that district, he said. Uh, I want to know its boundaries. I want to know who lives in that district. I want to know the socioeconomics of that district. I want to know everything about the congressperson in that district. And I want you to interview the congressman, the person who represents you in that district. So I began to work on the paper. And my congressman was Charles Buckley, a 30-year incumbent, the chairman of the powerful committee, the Public Works Committee. He was the boss of the Bronx. So I figured I'll go to his district office and ask for the opportunity to interview him. Lo and behold, there's no district office. So I call his office in Washington. I say, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a student at Columbia College. I have this uh, assignment. I want to interview the congressman. I left one message. I left a second message. I left a third message. No response. And uh, I, I submitted the paper without having the opportunity to interview the congressman. I thought my grade suffered a little bit. Um, I, I, I went to law school and a man named w, Francis W.H. Adams, who was a former police commissioner, was leading a, a revolt against the old line bosses governing the Democratic Party. Eleanor Roosevelt, Herbert Lehman, and he, and, 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 and the law students were all gathered. He said, look, you not only are, should become good lawyers, but you have to be active in the community. And we're trying to oust the, the bad guys, the old line Democrats who are not allowing young people into the party, who are, 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 are doling out patronage and, and as crony, cronyism nominations and judgeships and patronage. And I want you to get into politics. And so the names of those of people who were there were sent to the local club. And I got a I got a call from the Bronx Pelham Reform Democrat Club saying, mm -hmm. yeah, we know you went to that reception. We got your name. We're running some races and we'd like you to get involved. And I said, look, I, I love that reception. I, I, I enjoyed the message. I think it's right, but I can't get involved right now. I got three different jobs. I was working two hours a day in John Jay, the dining hall to get my three meals. I was selling newspapers for the Columbia Student Magazine Agency. I was dropping off the Columbia Daily Spectator and I was working at my dad's luncheonette. I, I don't have the time to do it. And I was going to school. And they said, no, no, we're running some good races. You, you got to get involved. I said, no, look, I, I, I will at some point in time, but I'm too busy now. No, no, we're running for party office and we're challenging the congressman in that district, Charlie Buckley. And I said, what did you say? That son of a, you know what? And that's, and I got involved in that campaign and that's how I got into politics. And it was a battle against the bosses. And sure enough, that led me a couple of years later to run uh, a David and Goliath race. I, I ran against my local assemblyman, a 17 year incumbent, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. I had no money. Uh, th there's a display here and they got my first button in my campaign. It's this big, it's so tiny. <laughs> I couldn't afford a button bigger than a quarter of an inch. And uh, 
Uh, I, I ordered some fortune cookies. I ordered 10,000 fortune cookies. <laughs> and I gave them out to people sitting on park benches. And uh, I said, you know, I'm Bob Abrams. I'm the independent Democrat, reformed Democrat running for the state assembly. I hope you vote in the primary. Here, have a fortune cookie. And they'd open up the fortune cookie and it would say, your good fortune is Bob Abrams for the assembly. Aww. And they chuckled. I got to try that. That's yeah. good. That's really good. Well, when I ran for borough president, I did 25,000 fortune. Wow. 25,000. <laughs> so, you know, you can't predict what's going to happen in life. It's all been great and exciting. So what do you think about the role of money in campaigns? Horrible. Campaign finance. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Well, I think public financing is the way to go. You know, in, in my view, public airwaves belong to the people. Should we, should we overturn Citizens United? I think so. Okay. You know, I think so. Um, I know the argument on the other side, but it's not fair when somebody with millions of dollars can come in and blow a, an opponent away. It's, uh, uh, you think and, corporations have a First Amendment right? You know, I think they do, they're right, but, but I, think, I think money pollutes politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, e even, you know, even if you're a, a, an honest person, it creates, if you have to raise money, it creates a perception. You know, you, you get accused. Why did you take $1,000 from that person? I think there are ways in which you can limit. First of all, New York City has a pretty good public financing mechanism, um, uh, a multiplier with uh, matching small contributions with multiples. Um, but I think it's, it's horrible what happens today. And it's being talked, the reform has been talked about for 25 years, and it doesn't get better. It gets worse each year in each cycle. You abide by a certain constitution, the duty to organize, the duty to get involved, the duty to vote. I mean, you spoke to my summer interns, and I thank you for that. You talked to them a little bit about that duty uh, to really get involved in your community and your local politics. Can you speak a little bit more about them, those values and those, that Bill of Rights? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, there's a perception today that... Uh, on the part of young people that they may not want to get involved mm. in politics because it's grimy. Um, um, you know, the stories abound of, of people who cross the, uh, cross the line, the ethical line. Uh, and I try to tell them, look, yeah, that happens. But my, my experience has been most of the people uh, I worked with in government and in politics were, were honorable, were decent. Um, and uh, they were competent. And so I, I want to encourage them uh, to get involved. And I said, look, I, I, we, we see doctors, librarians, mm -hmm. teachers, ministers. We, we hold them in high esteem. Uh, we say that they have a calling. Well, why shouldn't somebody in public life, somebody in public office, see that role and that responsibility as a calling? And that's what I try to tell students. That's what guided my career and my life. It was a privilege to be able to serve the public. It was an opportunity to be able to repair the world, to make changes, to make this a better place. Um, and so, you know, and I tell them when you're lying there in the bed and you don't have much time left and you're reflecting upon your life, wouldn't it be nice to think that Gee, during, I, I used that limited amount of time uh, to the best of my ability to make this world a better place, to make this planet more livable. And you can do that by being in public service, by running for public office, by being involved. You served during the um, Reagan era, and I served during the Trump era. <sighs> okay. So tell us a little bit about um, the Reagan era. Obviously, um, it pushed uh, state attorney generals forward um, on the national stage. And obviously, you were very much involved in federalism. Can you speak to the audience a little bit about your experience with the Reagan administration? Well, it's interesting because they're, they're comparable. Um, <clears throat> I got elected in 1978. Ronald Reagan got elected in 1980. He got elected on a platform of laissez-faire government get government off the back of business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't like politicians because they say one thing in a campaign and they do something else in the course of their governance. Ronald Reagan was true to his word. 
he appointed people to enforcement positions who did not believe in enforcing the law. The Federal Trade Commission didn't bring a single false advertising case in six years. Uh, the head of the antitrust division didn't believe in the Sherman and Clayton Act. In fact, wanted to repeal those two cornerstone uh, fundamental uh, uh, legislative enactments to enforce uh, antitrust laws. The Environmental Protection uh, Agency administrator didn't believe in enforcing the environmental laws. So he put the watchdog to sleep. And that created the opportunity for state attorneys general to step, step into the breach. And we did that. And for the first time, probably in history, there was this extraordinary cooperation of uh, uh, joint investigation and joint prosecution and challenging the Reagan government when it wasn't doing its job. And Utish came along in the Trump era in the same way because Donald Trump came to office and in a likewise fashion appointed people who were diminishing the rights of individuals, diminishing the rights of immigrants, uh, diminishing the rights of those who are seeking to live in a quality environment. Uh, the Clean Air Act and other environmental protection statutes were not being enforced. And so uh, attorneys general did the same thing in the Trump era as we did in the Reagan era. And I was proud to see how you were a leader uh, among attorneys general, bringing multiples of attorneys general together to bring lawsuits on the same day. Did you ever think that you would be in a position of implementing public policy through litigation? Well, I know sometimes uh, there's criticism about uh, the role of attorney general right. in, in creating public policy. I, I'm on the other side of that. I mean, uh, to me, it's good public policy to enforce the law. That's the role of the attorney general. The Congress enacts laws at the federal level. The legislature enacts laws and the governor signs them into law. What good is a law sitting in a law book in a library if it's not enforced? You have to make that law real. And so it's the role of the attorney general to enforce those laws. And I did that in the area of civil rights and in the area of antitrust and in the area of consumer protection. We went ahead and enforced laws. The Love Canal. It was the first time in the history of New York that a lawsuit was brought to clean up a toxic waste site. Here were people living in Western New York, 900 homes, two public schools, sitting on top of a waste site of 40 million pounds of, of dangerous uh, toxic chemicals. And people were getting sick. People were getting cancer. Women were having miscarriages. Children uh, were born with birth defects. And it was the role of the attorney general, as I was responding to complaints of people living in that community, uh, to, to do something about it. And even though we didn't have a strong statute, we used a common law concept uh, of uh, uh, causing a wrongdoer to clean up the mess that it created. Later on, as a result of the Love Canal, the, the Congress passed the Superfund statute and gave more authority to an attorney general. Uh, but we utilized that statute to bring that lawsuit to get back millions of dollars into the hands of uh, people who suffered and to have a cleanup of, of that site. And after that lawsuit, I brought 65 other lawsuits of toxic waste sites around the state to clean them up. So if that's public policy, so be it. I, I saw that as my role, and I saw that as good government policy, doing my job of, of, of protecting uh, the citizens of my state. You were a visionary. <clears throat> Um, you stood up on behalf of members of the LGBTQ community, um, on behalf of reproductive rights. You were way ahead of your time when it wasn't very popular, yeah. So speak to the audience and a little bit about why you felt it was necessary um, to stand up on behalf of a woman's right to choose. Well, it was part of what I just said. I mean, I, 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 there was nothing written in the law about my filing an amicus brief, a brief in the United States Supreme Court on behalf of women's right to choose, reproductive freedom. But I felt it's a fundamental right of a woman to be able to control her own body. And so 
I began to file briefs. It was rare at that time for a state attorney general to do that. I tried to reach out to my, some of my colleagues who had similar views uh, to join me in those briefs. So it was because, again, maximize the pa I was elected attorney general taking an oath of office saying I was going to enforce the laws of the state of New York and to the best of my ability, so help me God. And that's what I try to do. If, if I had the opportunity uh, to, to fight for women, uh, with respect to reproductive freedom or the right uh, in, the, in the workplace to be hired, or not to be sexually harassed, not to be discriminated against based upon their uh, sex, or to have people not discriminated against based upon their sexual orientation. I mean, I did that. I, I was the borough president of the Bronx in 1971. I came back to my office after testifying in the city council and my secretary, Peggy Rodriguez said, where were you? Where were you this morning? I said, why? She said, the phones, they're ringing off the hook. People are screaming. They're saying they're never going to vote for you again. Where was I? I was at City Hall, and I testified in support of a gay rights bill. And that was 1971. Mm. It was in a day when that was a very, very, very unpopular issue. But I felt in my own heart that people... Uh, People should be respected. Their sexual orientation shouldn't make a difference. They, they have a right to, to live a life. And uh, um, so that's, those were some of the, my, my, my motivating guideposts during the course of my career. So we find ourselves looking at what's happening in Texas and in Mississippi. Um, what's, what do you think is going to happen with respect to Roe v. Wade? Uh, I'm very distressed. I mean, one would have thought that Roe v. Wade was settled law. Yes that it didn't matter who was on the court, what your orientation was, it was settled law. Previous courts uh, with conservative and moderate and, and liberal justices had ruled in cases and it's very distressing to see what happens. And of course, it unfortunately affects uh, minority people, poor people the most. Um, it's very distressing. And I was gonna ask you, you know, what you, what you thought was going to be the outcome of all this. I mean, here we were over, over decades, we made gains. Um, uh, women were able to be able to uh, not be fearful about going to an abortion clinic or um, uh, being able to get contraception, uh, uh, being able to make uh, the most personal decisions about in their lives, controlling their own body. And now we have a whittling away of Roe v. Wade. And I know that you're again yeah. leading the way uh, to try to prevent that kind of, a, you know, incursion. But, you know, uh, are we going to see Roe disappear? I hope not. But I know that in this book, you de detail that way back in the 1970s, you defended the reproductive rights. You defended our right and on behalf of all women, not only in New York State, but those women in Mississippi and in Texas, we thank you. So you transformed the office of attorney general. Prior to your arrival, there were no regional offices. There were 16 regional offices as a result of uh, your vision. Regional offices from Buffalo all the way to Suffolk County and Long Island. Um, and you also obviously, um, focused on consumer rights and in, in the environmental on environmental space. Um, why did you find it necessary to revolutionize the office of attorney general? Well, again, it was, uh, I felt my obligation to try to maximize the role and the power of the attorney general on behalf, on behalf of the people and the public. Um, people should understand that this is an, you and I know this uniquely because we were both attorneys general. What a role, what an opportunity, what an office. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, it's malleable. The history of this office is that the attorney general was a defensive office. For 200 years, the bulk of 200 years, uh, the attorney general's role was to defend the state whenever the state was sued. And in the last half century or so, the attorney general's uh, role began to be redefined. Uh, the sovereign was not the only uh, entity that, that, that the attorney general should re represent. It's the people, it's the public interest. 
And so instead of merely being defensive, the attorney general went on the offensive, uh, began to launch investigations, began to launch lawsuits. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so I saw this as an exciting opportunity to be at the cutting edge, to do more and more in these various areas, to protect workers, to protect occupational uh, safety, safety of, at the work site, uh, to protect women, to protect children, to protect you know, uh, those who could not afford to fight against powerful interests, whether they be corporate interests or governmental bureaucratic interests. You know, one of the themes of the book, I think, that's encouraging is that the good guys can win. Yes. They're, they're, they, these are Herculean battles, and people can't do it alone. But the attorney general being, al being allied with individuals, with community groups, with advocacy groups, can bring lawsuits and can win, can bring about tangible results. And that's what made it so exciting for me. Um, and uh, it was all what I thought was my role, responsibility, and part of my job. So who are some of your role models, particularly in today's political landscape? What do you admire? Well, first of all, I, I, I admired uh, John Kennedy. He was a guy who gave me inspiration. Um, I, I cite in the book, I was at NYU Law School when he was sworn in. And I was in Hayden Hall watching that, this young, handsome guy without a top coat taking the oath of office. And I said to my friend, uh, Avram Weisberger, gee, you know, I, I see that as an opportunity to, uh, to be in public service. I, I, I look at what's happening here with a, this new guy coming into public office. And, you know, along the way, you and I should consider that. And he later became a judge and I later, you know, uh, ran, for, ran for public office myself. So, uh, you know, it's all part of you know, a, a, a fortunate life experience of being given the chance uh, to go and pursue, you know, uh, an opportunity of pursuing your values, you know, what you believe has to be done. You know, I, I, I saw the Attorney General's office as an ally of the people. That was uh, a motto on one of my campaign posters, ally of the people. Uh, people can't fight against huge companies and big law firms alone. They have to uh, work together. And if they do it in conjunction with the state attorney general yeah. who comes into court speaking in the name of the people of the state of New York and work together with other attorneys general across the country. You know, I, I was so proud of the fact that attorneys general, after I left office, when we created a joint investigations, went after the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. You know, here was an industry that was lying to the public, didn't tell the full truth about the addictive nature of cigarettes, how people were being deceived and, and being murdered. They were dying as a result of getting cancer from, from, from cigarettes. And they were preying upon young people and they were advertising practices. And here were attorneys general, 46 of them, getting together and causing the tobacco industry to pay $220 billion back into the, uh, uh, the treasuries of the states who suffered because they had to pay out the uh, medical expenses for those who were getting sick as a result of cancer and a reform of the advertising practices of the tobacco industry. So here was the Congress who for decades did nothing about this public policy issue, but now attorneys general were able to do that. And you know, in the opioid crisis that's happening now, attorneys general are on the front line as protectors uh, working on behalf of people and you know, I, I, I wanted to do as much as I could. You know, I held 47 hearings in New York State on environmental issues. I testified before the Congress 35 times. Nowhere in the job description of the Attorney General or in the Constitution or in the statutes does it say that the Attorney General should go to Washington to testify. But I thought, you know, it was important for my voice to be heard. On, import, on pending legislation. I thought it was important for me to use the bully pulpit, to make speeches before the Court of Appeals on Law Day, to talk about privacy rights. Uh, I thought it was important for me to issue reports uh, that would advance the cause of people's rights, environmental protection. Uh, and what an opportunity as, as the Attorney General. So, you know, I loved 
I considered myself the luckiest guy in the world, and I loved every moment that I was in that job. And I want to thank you. You know, we, uh, Juul, which is uh, one of the largest companies that produces vaping products, and it took a page out of Big Tobacco and they're marketing children. And as a result, as you know, our office is pursuing that case. And of course, there's a number of assistant attorney, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of assistants who are in the office who, who worked on the opioid settlement, resulting in a $1.5 billion judgment, which will go for education and mediation and prevention of individuals who unfortunately lost their lives and were struggling with the opioid crisis. And so we modeled it after all that you did. And I just wanted to thank you. Are there any assistant attorney generals in the Audience, please raise your hand. Okay, I see a couple. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. So um, in the book, you talk about how you met your lovely bride who's in the audience. Hello. Tell us how you met the love of your life. Well, I- You had was, all those jobs. When did you find time to meet? Yeah, well, that's, that was the point. I was, uh, that was so busy. Uh, I didn't get married till I was 36. It's okay. I, my mother says I'm tragically single, so <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, so one day, uh, a rabbi, I was active in the Soviet Jewry movement, uh, trying to work to get uh, relief for one quarter of the world's Jewish population living uh, in the 15 republics of the USSR, the Soviet Union. And um, I would go to rallies, I'd go to demonstrations. And one day at one of the demonstrations, this rabbi Gilbert Klapperman came over to me and he said, do I have the girl for you? <laughs> and then he gives me this piece of paper. He says, she's perfect for you, call her. She's got your sense of values. She's very attractive. She comes from a wonderful family. I know that family, call her. Said, Thank you, rabbi. Thank you, rabbi. And we go to another rally uh, a few weeks later. And he said, so new? Well, what's happened? Uh, I said, ah, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. And then one day, uh, Peggy Rodriguez, the woman who I talked about before, who was my secretary as Borough President Bronx, one day she opens the door, she says, Mr. President, she called me Mr. President. Mm -hmm. I was the Borough President of Bronx. <laughs> my mother was very impressed with that, Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President, that rabbi is on the phone. You know what he's going to talk about. Call her up. Call her up. It's an hour of your time. Who knows? Maybe something will happen. Maybe something will come of it. And she was right, 100% right. And so uh, uh, I married uh, Diane Shoulder, and uh, we've you know, done so much together over the years. And uh, she came to all the meetings of the National Association of Attorneys General. And the... Uh, my activity in the in the in NAG, the National yeah. Association of Attorneys General, gave me the right not only to meet colleagues. First of all, I, I wonder if the same is true with you. The people I worked with became my lifelong friends. Yeah. They, I, I didn't know them before, but we would join together, and it didn't matter whether they were Republicans or Democrats, men or women. They're, they're my strongest friends, and I think part of of that happened because we were given an opportunity to travel the world together. The United States Information Agency asked, for example, a, a delegation of attorneys general after the Berlin Wall fell to go to Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary to meet with parliamentarians to talk about democratic institutions, to talk about constitutional values. And um, when you travel like that, you, you develop real bonds of friendship and, and close relations. And of course, it was broadening for me. We went to the Soviet Union. We, uh, we traveled to different places. And, and Diane went with me on those trips. And so uh, um, I, 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 I thank Rabbi Kopperman for, uh, <laughs> for his leadership and persistence. And you served as the president of the National Association of Attorney Generals. And now we have NAG. We've got DAGA, Democratic Attorney Generals, RAGA, Republican Attorney Generals, CWAG, the Western uh, States Attorney General. So there's all of these organizations. What do you think of all of that? It's a lot of meetings, a lot of traveling. I try to just do either NAG or DAGA. What are your thoughts? So that's part of, I think, the change of the political scene. And it brings us to, back to your first question. I think uh, the partisanship that is dominating the political scene today 
Because when I was attorney general, there was the National Association of Attorneys General. And now the governors, they had their own partisan organization. Yeah. There was the Governors Association, but then there was also the Democratic Governors Association and the, and the Republican Governors Association. Uh, and in Attorneys General, there was only the National Association of Attorneys General. And since then, yeah. there's been the Republican Attorney General's Association and the Democratic Attorney General's Association. And uh, I, I think that unfortunately breeds partisanship and frankly, the fundraising that goes on with respect to that, uh, to me, uh, raises certain kinds of issues. And so I think it's unfortunate that we have drifted into that modality. But I can't have a discussion with some of my colleagues in red states on my litigation against the NRA. Um, I don't think they would accept my position on reproductive rights or my lawsuit um, the investigation that we're engaging in against a previous president. Um, whereas in DAGA, they accept that. So in NAG, we talk about big tech, which is bipartisan. Juul, it's bipartisan. So I try to find bipartisan issues that I can work with all of my colleagues. And then on some issues that I know uh, that my colleagues in red states would not accept, I try to work right. with them. Yeah, I was going to try ask, to find common ground. I was going to ask you about that because I'm, uh, you know, on your press release list, and I see that very often lawsuits are brought by 17 attorneys general or 14 attorneys general, and those are usually the Democrats on one on, the, on some of the more, you know, ideological issues. Um, uh, and and I was wondering whether or not there are many lawsuits brought by all or most of the attorneys general. I think uh, on the tech issues, on the tech issue, yeah. I saw that, uh, you know, whether it was Facebook or yeah. the other tech companies. I mean, obviously during the previous administration, it was much more partisan. Um, now we find ourselves again, coming together on some issues. Um, look, for instance, today I joined, um, co-authored a letter with respect to the situation in Texas involving the Haitian refugees um, that was signed on by 16 attorney generals, most of them in blue states. Um, so it depends, it all depends upon the issue. And I try to appeal to the humanity of all individuals and try to bring everyone together, particularly at a time when we find ourselves so divided in this country. We need to really speak with one voice. And it's really, it's difficult, it's very challenging. But nonetheless, you inspire me because you are the luckiest guy in the world. And I'm trying to get to that space. So what do you, do you miss public life? Of course. Um, what do you miss but, about it? But, well, I tr even though I spent 28 years in public life, three different offices, in the legislature, in the assembly, as borough president, and four terms as attorney general. And then I, I went into private practice, but I told the law firm that I was with, Strick and Strick and LeVan, I said, look, if I'm to come here, I mean, public service and public issues are part of my essence. I can't do without involvement in those issues. And they said, they gave me the green light. Mm. I mean, you, you, you know, we're, we're a firm with a hundred year history and we do a lot of pro bono work. And uh, they gave me the opportunity to continue uh, pro bono activity. Uh, so the, one, the organization that I worked with when I was attorney general, the Center for Reproductive Rights, uh, I brought to the law firm as a client and we filed briefs on behalf of United States senators on these abortion and choice issues, uh, members of the House and members of the Senate. Um, so I worked on lots of issues over the last 25 years uh, that were uh, public service and pro bono issues. So yes, I missed uh, the activity of public life, but it was a carryover into my private life. And so again, I considered myself lucky because you know, perhaps I had the best of both worlds. For the first time, I was really earning a living. And uh, at the same time, uh, I was able to still do a lot of pro bono things. The mayor of New York appointed me to, to be uh, a member of the Charter Revision Commission. The governor appointed me to be co-chair of a task force after Superstorm Sandy to see whether or not uh, the utilities uh, behaved in a, an appropriate and, and responsive way. Um, I, I, I worked with my colleagues uh, on behalf of Don Siegelman, the former governor of Alabama, who I thought was unfairly 
treated in a, in a, po a political prosecution. And I got 113 former attorneys general, Republicans and Democrats, to file a brief on his behalf before the United States Supreme Court. I, I, I worked with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon community, to resolve certain issues with the Jewish community. You know, so there were the, I, I went to Uzbekistan, I went to Siberia on behalf of the joint, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee to monitor uh, programs. Uh, there was lots of exciting things uh, that uh, were on my plate when I was in the private sector that replicated the kinds of things I was doing when I was in public. Where are all your papers? They're in the archives. Uh, Here? <laughs> uh, this, this is uh, the sponsor of this uh, forum tonight is uh, the New York State Archive Partnership. And uh, I'm such an admirer uh, of the work of the archives. They've got 270 million documents mm. under their control and in their possession. And it's so important to preserve these documents, not only to document the history of this great state, but also in terms of public policy, because scholars, mm. um, students can come here and investigate, look at files uh, and, and determine, you know, what happened in the past and what can happen going forward. Uh, Tom Roller, who is the uh, the CEO of, of this whole organization, the archivist for New York State, gave me a tour today. And, and we were looking at uh, documents relating to incarceration. Mm. And, uh, you know, I said, so why is all this stuff here? He said, well, you know, scholars want to know about prison work. What do you do with prisoners as it relates to work? And, and, and you can learn from what happened in the past, what happens in other states, uh, so this is a, an extraordinary institution that has an important public role. So you talked um, a little bit about prisons. Can you talk a little bit uh, about Attica? Um, I, I remember the, the, the um, section about Attica and it, it came up recently in my office. And I just wanted to talk to you a little bit before all these individuals about Attica. And yeah, well your... that predated me. That was uh, the Attica attack came during uh, my predecessor's administration. Um, and there was litigation, you know, and obviously there's, uh, and, and we haven't talked about this yet, you know, uh, the, the, there's the role of the attorney general offensively, and there's the role defensively, and you have to defend the state when there are all kinds of lawsuits, and many of them are not overly popular right. lawsuits. Right. Prisoners file lawsuits about the, uh, the quality of their health care, the quality of nutrition, their religious opportunities. Uh, you know, all kinds of issues uh, get thrown at you. And most of the people don't realize that probably two thirds of the lawyers in the attorney general's right. office are assigned to these defensive cases because they read in the newspaper about the affirmative work of the attorney general. So- um, Was there ever a case where you decided you refused to represent the state? Not refuse, but uh, you know, you- a Conflict? Well, you know, you try to- <laughs> You try to dance a little bit and walk. Uh, How well do you dance? Walk, walk. <laughs> on the dance floor, I don't walk too well, but uh, <laughs> but in the court system, sometimes we did some interesting things as as it related to, we'll say, gay rights mm. and the uh, constitutionality of the sodomy laws. Um, you know, we played, I think, an important role uh, in making the courts understand that there was some legitimate privacy and constitutional issues that generated reversal of previous cases. Do you see any room for any change um, with respect to the Office of Attorney General? Any, any areas for reform? Well, you know, uh, there's always an opportunity for change. When, when I became Attorney General on the defensive side, for example, um, uh, the custom was that the Attorney General was there uh, to represent all the state agencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thought on the part of state agencies was that you've got the obligation to re represent me in any and all cases. Go all the way to the Supreme Court. We try to say, jawbone a little bit, say, wait a minute, sure. We're gonna represent you where there is legitimacy and justice and colorable authority. But wait a minute, if we lost the lawsuit because the state was wrong, because the state was not doing enough. For example, uh, there was a lawsuit brought against the state police uh, when I first became attorney general. And the state police was doing a terrible job in outreach in trying to make it 
more reflective of the population of the state. They had horrible numbers relating to minority people, horrible numbers of any women at all at that time in the state, uh, in the state police force. And this lawsuit raised some legitimate issues. And I told the state police, look, we can't properly defend this lawsuit in, in the Circuit Court of Appeals. The, the decision of the district court was right and was appropriate. And you, know, you all should face up to reality and the facts. And we had to educate agencies and counsel to agencies that we're not just gonna be a spear thrower. Uh, we're not just gonna just automatically and reflexi reflective, reflexively defend every single lawsuit even if the state is wrong. And so, you know, change is always uh, uh, an opportunity in, 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 as it relates to state governments. So you spoke a little bit about testifying before Congress, testifying before the state legislature, um, and also issuing reports. And I know a little bit about issuing some reports. <laughs> um, so, uh, so to what extent did that, did all of, um, did that responsibility and those roles play with respect to public policy um, and getting laws changed, et cetera? Well, I think it had an impact. When you issue a report, uh, we issued a report on toxic accidents. Mm -hmm. uh, the state was not compiling data uh, with respect to toxic accidents happening in New York State. The federal government was not uh, telling the public uh, uh, all that was happening and giving appropriate information. Um, you know, we issued reports on acid rain. I was horrified to learn that the burning of high sulfur coal um, in power plants in the Midwest in violation of the Clean Air Act was destroying and killing for all time. Mm -hmm. uh, irredeemable. These lakes were being poisoned and the fish had no prospect for, for life in, in those lakes. And so we issued reports. We went to court. We went uh, administratively before the EPA. We filed lawsuits in court. So again, time after time, opportunity to try to do whatever could be done on behalf of the public on a given issue, given issue by an important player called the state attorney general. Again, you were a man before your time. Thank you for all that you have done with respect to climate change and believing in science. I thank you. So we're coming to the end of the program. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. <clears throat> We're coming to the end of the program. And so my last question to you, um, Attorney General Abrams is, what advice do you have for me? Usually we, we speak privately, but we're just in front of our friends. You know, how am I doing? You're doing great. <laughs> and, and you should keep going. You know, you and I had private conversations uh, um, as you were running as a candidate. Uh, you honored me by asking me to serve on your transition team. And I, and I honestly told you, Tish, you're inheriting an office that is fantastic. It's unique. The Attorney General has such an opportunity for his public service, for protection of the public. Uh, there are great people in this office, higher on the merits, uh, continue to attract quality people, do what you think is right, be gutsy and courageous. And, and you've done all that. I mean, I, I was asked uh, today before coming out here, I was interviewed by public radio and they asked me about uh, your handling of the uh, investigation of allegations uh, against the governor about sexual harassment. And I said, look, uh, and uh, the question was, you know, was there any politics involved? I said, what, what do you mean politics? The governor asked for that investigation. The governor asked for that investigation. And he tried to manipulate the investigation. He originally wanted to have two people to conduct the, uh, the investigation. And the attorney general courageously said, no, no, it's my role and my responsibility to conduct that investigation if you're asking me to do it. Uh, and then you appointed two extraordinarily experienced people and they did their work methodically. They issued a report widely, universally acclaimed as being a professional report, thorough, you know, hundreds of people who were, uh, who were uh, interviewed and, uh, you know, the report stood, stood the test of, of integrity and independence. And, uh, you know, so my advice to you is 
keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much. The name of the book is The Luckiest Guy in the World. It's on sale for, I believe, $30, if I'm not mistaken. Whatever. Um, he's donating it all to charitable causes. So please pick up your book. Please pick up the book and please read my forward. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you. Thank you so much.